Hi. My name is Sarah Kidd, and I am going to be presenting my research along with the research of Sneha Rowe and Ian Edgars from the Estuary Partnership on looking at multispectral UAV data for wetland plant community mapping and habitat um, evaluation. I'm so excited to give this talk, and thank you for joining me today. So for those of you who are not familiar with the Estuary Partnership, we have several monitoring programs. And I'm just gonna give a little bit of background about those programs today, because that is really where our goals and objectives for our uh, technology and UAV use come from. Our ecosystem monitoring program is a long-term status and friends program where we look at the habitat conditions and salmonid food web conditions across the entire estuary. So it's a status and trends program. And then we pair that data with our action effectiveness monitoring and research program so that we can help evaluate restoration projects post-restoration. And these data come together and help us um, inform adaptive management across restoration sites and really better conserve, restore, and maintain the estuary environment. Now, for our UAV applications, our goals and objectives are fairly specific that I'm going to talk about today. We really like the idea of mapping dominant plant communities across an entire project or a restoration site, and then pairing that data with the site hydrology data to get a really good understanding of salmon habitat conditions across an entire project. Now, we also are working to track changes over time, utilizing the UAV or drone imagery, such as native and non-native plant community dominance, above ground plant biomass, changes in channel development, and topography. As we move into today's talk, I'm going to mainly be talking about our plant community and habitat condition models that we have developed using data from our drone that is a DGI Phantom 4. It has a standard RGB camera and it also has a near infrared camera on it. So it has two cameras. And this is a really affordable setup. It costs about $4,000 and we have had a lot of success using it across our projects. Um, we've been using it since 2017 and we use the PIX4D to do our project mapping, so mapping our flight plans, in addition to processing the raw data. For post-processing um, and analysis, we're using Tableau and R and ArcGIS. So for our vegetation or plant community modeling, this is such an important project because Classically, with our monitoring programs, we collect only a small amount of data. We're limited by time and capacity to only spend a few days of the year at a site collecting vegetation data. And so we go out and we collect in a representative uh, vegetation grid with one meter uh, quadrats. We do transects. But at the end of the day, we only collect you know, less than 1% of the acreage of a project. And this is really highly detailed and informative data, but being able to take that data and then leverage it to map the plant community conditions across an entire project is so extremely powerful. So for example, I'm talking about a project today that is about 200 acres. And for our veg grid and our transect uh, community mapping, we were only able to actually survey about 0 0.2 acres. But with the power of the drone model, we were able to project that across the entire site. Now, the project I'm going to talk about today specifically is the Waluski project. I'm using it as an example to highlight our methods and objectives and outcomes. Um, so if you'd like to learn more about it, I'll provide some links and you can read this later. But the main thing to know about the Waluski project is that it was restored in 2017. It was three years old, three years post-restoration, when we collected the drone imagery. We did just collect five-year data this summer, so we're going to be excited to compare it. Um, and it is a um, very tidal site. It's located in Young's Bay in Astoria, and I've actually been collecting data on this site since 2013. I'm going to jump right into our methods and the data that we collect in the field to produce our model and our maps. So here is the overall site map. You can see that these red dots are our vegetation grid. So that's the classic method of collecting really detailed vegetation data. Then the purple dots are ground control points, so GCPs. 
These are collected to inform the drone data processing. We need these ground control points to produce accurate elevation maps of the site with the drone imagery. We also collect photo points at these locations and make notes about dominant plant community classifications. Now, this is really important because while we get very, very detailed data in the veg grid, having a distribution of information across a site for dominant plant communities is really critical to our model development. Now for this flight in 2020, we did this at about 300 feet elevation. We had an 80% forelap and side lap, and this is very standard for our data collection. We did this project over two days because it's a very large project. As I said, it's about 200 acres. And we try to go for peak low tide, but as you know, these things take time and you can see that there is some water in the channels. However, most of the site was dry at the time of flight, particularly those dominant plant communities. This allows us to create really accurate and high resolution RGB map or imagery, a raster, a digital surface model, a DTM, which is the terrain model. We have a near infrared map that we are using. We also have the NDVI index, which was produced with the near infrared data. And these are all layers that we have in the post-processing from PIX4D that we combine in ArcGIS to do the model development. So we use supervised classification and training polygons to create our vegetation classification model. This is heavily informed by our ground control point and our vegetation grid data for drawing those polygons and making them as accurate as possible. Because we have such a high resolution imagery, as you can see here, you can very clearly see the recanary grass. I can tell where the very the recanary grass transitions into bulrush and then transitions into cattails from this image. Um, one thing to note is that if you're going to do this, you should be really careful to mask out any extremely high or low elevation areas in your map. So just because you map a large area, you're going to clip that to just where you want to make the model. You're going to leave out areas that are extremely high or extremely low because you can classify those later. Maybe there's a hill, maybe there's a forest, maybe you have some channel. You want to head, go ahead and minimize the amount of area that you need to run your model, creating less variability. Then you're going to iteratively run those classifications and create those veg polygons to create them essentially the best model you can. You can run statistics to see how accurate your model is. I'm leaving a um, reference here that provides a really detailed walkthrough on how to run through all of this. And we find that we can get up to 95% accuracy on most of our projects. And of course, some areas may require some cleanup or clipping post model. Now, this is what our model looks like once we pull it out of ArcGIS and into Tableau. You can very easily interact with the data. You can do statistical analysis. You can come up with acres um, of habitat percent cover. And then we take that and we can compare our veg grid data to the model data. And what's really important here is that we had two veg grids. And I'm going to show the percent cover of the dominant plant communities across those different veg grids and then for the entire model. Here in the northern grid, we see that we have about 65% native cover and about 5% non-native. In the southern grid, you can see that it's very different. We have much greater non-native cover in the southern grid. It's about 53% non-native cover. Now, this difference is something that we would not really know how to interpret if we did not have a large scale, highly accurate digital elevation and obliques images and um, RGB images of the site. So traditionally, we would see this data, we'd say, OK, well, some areas are doing really well, some areas are struggling, and that is because there's this elevation gradient. The southern grid was in a much higher elevation that does take longer to restore. And sometimes that recanary grass can hold out for a while. Now, by taking the information and extrapolating across the entire site, we see that across the site, 70% of the habitat is native. So that Northern grid was actually much more representative of the site um, overall than the Southern grid. I find this a really fascinating way to compare the data and also to understand the power of of looking at a full site when evaluating restoration success and looking to target restoration adaptive management.
Now, the next step is to combine that data with our water surface elevation and temperature data to understand how the salmon habitat opportunity shifts over time and across the site. Now, first, I want to define my terms. Salmon habitat opportunity is essentially a metric where you identify a minimum depth and different thresholds for temperature to evaluate the conditions for salmonids. Salmon need about a half a meter of water to access areas such as channels and floodplain, and they also require different temperature thresholds. So anything over about 22 degrees Celsius is considered uh, suboptimal or too hot. Um, so we use these thresholds to define conditions across the entire site. And we do that by taking our data logger data, so we have data loggers across the site, and combining that with our digital elevation model. And so now I'm going to show you what that looks like. Here is a map of the habitat access. <coughs> so this is showing you that most of the site, about 67 percent or 128 acres, is accessible during the dry months, June to October on average. So this is an average water surface elevation we're using across that time period. And you can see here in the photo what that kind of looks like at low tide. You can see a lot of that plant community is exposed at low tide, and then it does become engaged to a certain extent at high tide. Now, in the wet season, um, we have an increase in accessibility, about 137 acres. And I do want to note here, so this is a king tide image of about the same angle. And you can see that photo was taken where that circle is. This side is highly engaged by the tides. And just because it is red in the map does not mean that it's not getting wet. It just means on average, that area is not accessible to salmon with a half a meter of water. Now, if we add in the habitat opportunity or those temperature thresholds, you can see that the 128 acres of accessible habitat in the dry months was had about 62% of the time had optimal temperature conditions. Now, you compare that to the winter or the wet months, and almost 100% of the time, the, they had optimal conditions in the accessible habitat. This is a really powerful way of viewing the data and looking at habitat development across an entire site. Now, the third step is to combine these data with the habitat vegetation model. Now we're looking at the June through October timeframe for access and opportunity. And we see that during this time frame, about 59 acres or 46% of the site is engaged, accessible native habitat. And this is a really powerful tool and it's gonna help us target habitat restoration and goals and objectives moving forward. We're also going to hopefully be able to take this and apply it to modeling future projects and also thinking about sea level rise and climate change adaptations across projects. So last slide, we're going to continue to work on this. We're going to continue to refine it, and we want to start tracking channel development more closely, topographic change more closely, and then thinking about carbon stocks and thermal sensing. We got a brand new drone. Sneha has been using it, and we're excited to also roll out those results. So thank you very much. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. All the data I presented today is in our Tableau online dashboard. and. Last but not least, many thanks to all of our partners and to my research partners on this project. Have a great day.